Welcome to the Martin Roth Symposium. Presented by IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, in cooperation with Republika, this second Martin Roth Symposium takes place as a digital theme week from 7th to 11th September 2020. Also, kindly supported by the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, where we are now, and funded by Germany's Federal Foreign Office. Every two years, this symposium aims to bring together thought leaders from the cultural, the political, academic and artistic sectors to share ideas and future scenarios. And before we go into the museum, we are very honored to welcome a remarkable guest to say a few words. Federal President Frank-Walter Steinmeier. Liebe Freunde und Wegbegleiter von Martin Roth, verehrte Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer des Symposiums. Die Capri-Batterie von Josef Beuys, diese Verknüpfung einer gelben Glühbirne mit einer Zitrone in einer Ausstellung über die Aufklärung. Wie passt das zusammen? Martin Roth erklärte seine Entscheidung so. Die Aufklärung brachte künstlerische Freiheit und Unabhängigkeit. Erst sie gaben Beuys die Kreativität, neue Kunsterkenntnisse in einer kulturübergreifenden Auseinandersetzung zu finden. So visionär, so genial, so Martin Roth. Wir alle kannten Martin Roth als leidenschaftlichen Museumschef und nimmermüden Brückenbauer über soziale, kulturelle und politische Grenzen hinweg. Er sah Museen als Institutionen der Aufklärung, als Marktplätze der Ideen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie alle in den kommenden Tagen an seinen Ideen weiterarbeiten wollen. Zwischen Hongkong und New York, Moskau und Kapstadt, Abuja und La Paz, London und Paris. Diese internationale Lern- und Wissenschaftsgemeinschaft hätte ihm gefallen. Die weltweit wachsenden antiliberalen Tendenzen bereiteten Martin Roth große Sorgen der Brexit schmerzte den bekennenden Europäer und Weltbürger sehr. Der Direktor des Victoria and Albert Museums in London sah den Ausstieg Großbritanniens aus der Europäischen Union als Zeichen einer zunehmenden Selbstisolation und eines übersteigerten Nationalismus, als eine Bedrohung des kulturellen Bewusstseins, das nur global existieren kann. Für Martin Roth drohte die Seele der Museen daran zugrunde zu gehen. Diese Herausforderung, davon war Martin Roth überzeugt, können sich Museen nur stellen, wenn sie demokratische Räume sind, Räume für globale, vielstimmige und kritische Dialoge. So wie die Demokratie von Debatten lebt, sah Martin Roth es als Aufgabe der Museen, eine Plattform für offene Diskussion und respektvolles Streiten zu bieten. Das bedeutet zum einen absolute Offenheit in der Konzipierung von Ausstellungen, Raum und zeitübergreifend sollten sie sein, losgelöst von kategorischem Denken, basierend auf Zusammenarbeit auf gleicher Augenhöhe in einem weltweiten Dialog. Zum anderen braucht es Mut zur Kollision. Martin Roth begnügte sich nicht mit der simplen, harmonischen Präsentation von Objekten, sondern suchte stets nach Momenten der Auseinandersetzung. Museen müssen Objekte, Themen und Ideen miteinander streiten lassen. Denn erst durch Offenheit und Kollision können neue Gedanken entstehen. Meine Damen und Herren, Museen seien, so sagte Martin Roth, eine intellektuelle Freihandelszone, in der sich jeder frei bewegen können müsse. Hierarchische Dialoge, Zensuren und Verbote lehnte er vehement ab. Diese Zonen des freien Austausches gilt es gerade heute nicht nur zu bewahren, es gilt sie zu schaffen. Mehr denn je benötigen wir dabei die internationale Zusammenarbeit, denn keine einzige Herausforderung des 21. Jahrhunderts lässt sich noch mit den Mitteln des Nationalstaates allein lösen. Eine gemeinsame Verantwortung für diese globalen Herausforderungen werden wir aber nur dann übernehmen können, wenn wir sie durch gemeinsames Handeln 
einüben. Deshalb begrüße ich sehr, wenn der DAD, Museen und Universitäten heute gemeinsam ein Programm zur Ausbildung von internationalen Museumsmanagern der nächsten Generation starten und sich gleich drei Ressorts der Bundesregierung zusammentun wollen, um die internationale Kooperation der Museen zu stärken. Meine Damen und Herren, das Museum als lebendiger Ort der Demokratie, als Ort der aufklärerischen Auseinandersetzung, als Ort der ideellen Inspiration, damit hat uns Martin Roth einen Weg in die Zukunft der Museen gewiesen. Ich bin mir sicher, er hätte sich nichts sehnlicher gewünscht, als dass wir seine Gedanken weitertragen und diesen Weg gemeinsam weiter bestreiten. Ich habe mit Josef Beuys begonnen und schließe damit, er sagte, das Museum ist ein Ort der permanenten Konferenz. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich Ihnen allen offene Diskussionen und zahlreiche konstruktive Gedankenkollisionen. Thank you, Mr. Federal President. Let's go into the museum and meet our special guests of today, who will share some welcome words with us. We are walking through the Dinosaur Hall in the central atrium of the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin to meet Johannes Vogel, Director General of the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Hello Mr. Vogel, it's a big pleasure to have the Martin Roth Symposium 2020 taking place in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Thank you, Ms. Gallus. Welcome to the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin, the Leibniz Institute for Biodiversity and Evolutionary research. So we are a global museum in the heart of Berlin, a global capital, trying to scope, trying to search for the future of museums. We are, to a large part, a biological and geological institute, but these are all very important things when, if we want to survive on this one planet Earth that we have. That is a major part of our research, but at the same time, We want to foster a different relationship between culture and nature, between society and science. And for that, we are extremely proud to host the Martin Roth Symposium 2020. You will get glimpses into the museum and its work. I hope you are very much enjoying this conference. It's very important that we all think about what the future of museums hold. And I think this symposium will make a major impact on the discussion of where museums have to go to in the future. Thank you very much. Welcome again to Berlin. And I hope that you really enjoy this fantastic symposium. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Let's move on. We are walking through the system Earth Hall, where we will explore the interdependence of organisms in our planet, but also its connection to the cosmos surrounding it. And here we are in the colorful Evolution in Action Hall, where we will have the pleasure to hear a few words from Marion Ackermann, General Director of the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden. Thank you, my pleasure. Hello, my name is Marion Ackermann. I'm the Director General of the Dresden State Art Collections, as has been Martin Roth for 10 years. I'm so happy to be part of this wonderful symposium. Our responsibility as museums with encyclopedic collections is to transfer knowledge and to offer a public space for discourse of a many-voiced diverse audience. The principle of sharing is a challenge and great opportunity at the same time of the 21st century, strengthened by digital media. Democratic forms of knowledge acquisition have shown their special value on the internet. Of course, we too must ask ourselves how accessible our knowledge really is. Here I want to mention the pioneering role of the Dresden State Art Collections regarding open access in Germany, the Daphne research, 
that is our collection and inventory project, which is reflected in online collections. Participation is a central tool of our museum work, as well as inclusion. The idea of viewing works of art and museum history in the sense of multi-perspective will play an even greater role in the future. For example, we include at the moment the view of international colleagues from Poland, from Lithuania, on the German Saxony history. The pandemic showed us how important international dialogue is. No, now, more than ever, we have to stay together and face future challenge in this complex, globalized world. We wish the symposium lively debates, constructive discourse, and many outcomes. Now, back to Ms. Gallas. Thank you, Ms. Ackermann. I'm very inspired and looking forward to our discussions. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mariet Westermann, Vice Chancellor of New York University Abu Dhabi and Professor of Arts and Humanities. She is also a member of the Martin Roth Symposium Advisory Group and therefore one of the minds behind the symposium. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Ms. Westermann. Thank you, Ms. Gallus. Welcome to Museum Futures, the second Martin Roth Symposium. In our planning sessions for the symposium, we like to call this event Mars with its ring of the future. Mars aims to do what Martin Roth did so well, gather thinkers, artists, makers and doers from a wide sphere of action to think together about what culture can do, should do or needs to do for society now and in the future. Much has changed since our first Mars in Berlin a magnificent event in 2018 that Martin would have loved for its energy, creativity, warmth, and its excellent food. We can't have that kind of symposium now, but we have tried to design a dynamic, interactive, and forward-looking program that will ask what museums can do in a time that has been especially difficult for them as an institutional type. After all, museums thrive on bringing people together for a few hours of learning, community, and enjoyment in a particular place. Our speakers have a sparkling range of ideas about how museums can re-establish, maintain, and extend their relevance in the world during the pandemic and in that hoped for time to come when its worst ravages will be behind us. COVID-19 has forced most conferences into video rooms like this and we know that can be wearying. Mars doesn't want to hang out all day on Zoom. The program will proceed in shorter, connected segments across five evenings, or nights, mornings, or afternoons, depending on where you are in the world. This conference is truly a global event. Martin was an international thinker and leader for the role of museums in society. He believed deeply in the power of museums to foster intercultural understanding, empathy, and solidarity. IFA, one of the sponsors of Mars, has had a long history of fostering cultural collaboration across borders, and it has shown great commitment to the ideals of Martin Roth, whose vision for museum futures we need today more than ever. I hope you will participate vigorously in the events of the next five days. Here are their themes. Today, our speakers will address museums and futures. Tomorrow, we will consider museums and power. On Wednesday, we go to a place few dare to go, museums and entertainment. On Thursday, the question of museums and architecture is on the virtual table. And on Friday, our closing day, we will be streaming live from the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin and talk about museums and failure before we turn back to the future in a closing session. Thank you for joining our community for a week. I wish you all a great Martin Road Symposium. The future of museums is now. Thank you, Ms. Westermann. That gives us the perfect introduction to get the second Martin Road Symposium started.
Let's dive into today and talk about museums and futures. Today we present a global perspective on the future of the museum as a space of democracy. It aims to illuminate the museum as a source of inspiration for intellectual, for political and aesthetic discourses and as a visible architectural signal for the development of cities. The discussions will offer regional insights and museum leadership in different cultural and political contexts, a historical view on the role of museums and raise awareness for the current technological challenges that the museum world is facing. I'd like to give you an overview how we will present the symposium this year under the very special current circumstances. IFA, Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, Germany's oldest intermediary organization for international cultural relations, is the organizer of the Martin Roth Symposium. But this year's symposium, ah, it's a little bit different. Due to the global COVID-19 pandemic, IFA and the symposium's advisory board have decided to relocate the second edition of the Martin Roth Symposium into the digital space and welcome a reduced Berlin audience at Museum für Naturkunde on Friday, complying of course with the current hygiene rules. And today, we will be exploring the topic Museums and Futures. Speakers will present their thoughts on the topic and the questions in sprint sessions, which are 10-minute inputs. And today, we have with us Kavita Singh, professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics of Jevahela Nero University in Delhi. Also with us, Philip Tinari, director and chief executive of UCCA Center for Contemporary Art of Beijing. And also, Zelfira Dregulova, director of the state Tretaikov Gallery, Moscow. Andrew McLillan, Professor of Art History at Tufts University and also Alain Bieber, Director of the NRV Forum Düsseldorf. Following the speakers, we will have a deep dive, which means a deep exchange between you, the participants and the speakers. And as we are all now in the virtual space, it'll be a 15 minute live online exchange in a digital discussion room. And here, here you can meet many of our speakers for Q&As after their sessions. To find out how to participate, just click on the button Dabei sein, take part on the website campus.republica.com. And before opening for questions or comments, some first responders present their thoughts on the sprint. It's a kickoff for the following lively discussions. And our first responder of today, that's Clementine Delis, Associate Curator of KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin. And we close the day with our Future Forward session. It's a conversation between a forward-thinking professional and a student responder to provide a look into today's topics from their perspectives and, of course, from their backgrounds. So. Let's get started with our first day of the Martin Roth Symposium and let's have inspiring discussions together. Hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. I have to confess that I come to this panel from a tangent or rather from two tangents. Firstly, I'm tangential to this panel because I don't work in a museum and I don't run one. I teach art history in a university. So my position is of a museum observer rather than a museum maker. Secondly, I'm based in New Delhi in India. And despite the long history of India and all the art that it's produced over the centuries, my country is not noted for its great museums or for its strongly rooted museum cultures. Museums are simply not a feature of our everyday cultural life the way they are in Paris or Berlin or New York. So the first point that I want to make is that even though we don't have vibrant culture of museum going, there is actually a remarkable feature of the history of museums in India that deserves to be better known. We're often told that museums were imposed upon India by colonialism and that the institution never really took root here. But the fact is that in the colonial period, these colonial museums were hugely popular. And in the early 20th century, the visitorship of some of the major museums in India was larger than the visitorship of the British Museum in the same year. One museum, the Madras Museum, actually counted 70,000 visitors on the same day. Now, this was a day of a traditional festival that is meant to celebrate the faculty of sight. And it's a custom on that day for families to go out and see something together. So when the museum arrived, it offered something special to see. 
And we see how in this instance, the colonial institution of the museum intersected with the old tradition of a festival to produce a viewing situation that I assume is quite different from the viewing situations encountered by museums anywhere else in the world. Now, museum keepers tell us that a majority of this huge number of visitors that came were poor, illiterate people who were not actually interested in what the museum was trying to tell them. Instead, they were using the museum on their own terms. And even today, the museums in India that are free to visit or that are very cheap to visit are filled with very large working class crowds. And historically, it's understood that their presence in the museum has kept the middle class out of the museum. This frustrates museum staff because they don't manage to reach their intended audiences. But I think that this phenomenon actually has a very profound meaning for the history of democracy. In India, society is very hierarchical and even temples did not allow everybody to enter them. The lowest castes were considered untouchable and they only gained the right to enter temples after India's independence in 1955 when certain new laws that didn't allow this kind of discrimination to be exercised were passed. So in India, the museum is actually the first civic space in which the poorest of the poor, the lowest of the low could enter as a right. And I think therefore that it is here in the museum that the most incredibly marginalized people of India got their first taste of what it is to be a citizen with rights. It is here that they got their first intimation of what democracy can be. The reason that I'm bringing up these things from the past in a panel that's looking to the future is because I want to stress that we don't have the same past and therefore we don't have the same future. And despite all of our interconnections, despite the fact that we read the same books or we take an interest in the same phenomena, context matters. And even when it looks like we are building the same kind of institutions or we are having similar viewing experiences, what that institution means or what that viewing experience is, is contextually determined. And in different places, museums, democracy and the future can be very different things. The second point that I want to make is about how we then move towards imagining a different kind of future. Today, although India is a backwater in the museum world, there are a lot of art collectors and museologists and bureaucrats and politicians who have been making noises about trying to catch up with the museum world elsewhere. And one of the ways in which this catch up game has manifested in many places of the world is through the commissioning of very spectacular museum architecture. Ever since the success of the Guggenheim in Bilbao, other places have tried to replicate its formula and for some time, China was the world epicenter of this phenomenon with literally thousands of new museums being built within the space of a decade. Many of these new museums had very eye-catching buildings and architects were given free reign in their design. Now we know that a lot of these projects actually tied in with real estate companies that wanted to build a brand for townships by including a signature building, but they did not have the know-how or the patience to invest in building collections, staffing the institution, or running programs that would make the museums come alive. So China now is saddled with hundreds of ghost museums, empty museum buildings that are going to have to find new uses. If this strategy of investing in collecting museum buildings has its pitfalls then, building a museum collection is also fraught with danger. Looking back on the fact that the great collections of the past were made under the ages of colonialism and looking today at how many attempts to build museum collections get entangled with the illegal art trade, we have to realize that this making museum collections is actually not a normal kind of activity. It is not an activity that gets done under free and fair conditions, both historically and in the present. It seems to feed off conditions of radical inequality and radical unfairness.
Now, international organizations tell us that the ethical thing to do today is to refuse to buy things that have a bad provenance and that in time, the market for them will get depressed and unprovenanced antiquities will be squeezed out. We've all seen how that's worked out during these past years. So I say, let us move away from the model where the museums are the end point of the market. And let's move towards a model where the museum is the starting point of a lending library. Let's start sharing and circulating museum collections that already exist. We know that there are so many collections that have vast amounts of material that are lying in storage unseen. Let's tap these. Let's build a true community of cooperation. It would be such a better way to fulfill the needs of empty museums that are desirous of collections. And I think that this model of sharing will also have implications for the many repatriation demands that are multiplying nowadays. A lot of repatriation demands are made in the spirit of restitution to undo past sufferings. But past sufferings cannot be undone and a joint future can be built. A redistributive justice is so much better than a retributive one. Let's try to share. Finally, the third point I want to make, and this is very much from my perspective in India, but perhaps it will have resonance elsewhere. Although we are not a country with a great public interest in museums, there is a great deal of public interest in matters that are very close to museums. History, for example, is something that is very broadly discussed in India and very hotly debated over there. And the role of artworks and archaeological finds as evidence of history are very closely scrutinized and sometimes becomes front page news. But our museums play no role as authoritative adjudicators in these debates or even as lively platforms where these discussions can take place. Partly this is because our museums are state owned. They are strangled by their own bureaucracy or because they are organs of state. They have to toe an official line and they cannot afford any controversies. Ideally, a museum should have the same autonomy that a university has. But I don't think this is going to be possible. And in the absence of that kind of freedom within the museum, my hope is that vitality and energy will come to our museums from outside, from other sources. If a museum's education department is not doing much, nothing stops others from using museum collections for education, to offer alternative guided tours, to use museum displays as a launching point for interdisciplinary discussions. What would it be to be guided through a gallery full of Hindu sculptures of gods and goddesses in India's National Museum by a Dalit, a member of what were formerly called the lowest, the untouchable castes? What would it be like to be guided through the British Museum by an Iraqi refugee and not as guides that are trained to recite a predetermined script written by the museum authorities, but to hear what these people might have to say about these objects from their own perspectives. These are some of the things I'd like to see someday in the future of museums. But I'm interested in knowing what you have to say about these ideas. And so let's discuss it when we get into my deep dive. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here coming to you today from UCCA Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing. I'm Philip Tenari, uh, Director and Chief Executive of this institution. And it's a, a specific pleasure and honor to be part of the Martin Roth Symposium, uh, having had the uh, pleasure of knowing uh, Dr. Roth a bit during his travels in China uh, throughout his career. Um, our topic today is museums and the future. And I think often when we address this topic, we're thinking of it more from a, a technological angle and asking about the impact of things like virtual reality and augmented reality and new kinds of digital technologies on our museological practice. But I today wanted to change a bit the frame of that conversation and think more about museums and the future in terms 
of the rhetorical and cultural and political and discursive frameworks which museums as institutions imply. Um, I think UCCA is very well situated to engage in this conversation. Uh, UCCA was established in 2007 uh, by a Belgian collector of Chinese contemporary art by the name of Guy Ullens and situated inside a set of factory chambers designed by East German architects built with Soviet capital located on the outskirts of Beijing in 1957, which were then transformed just five decades later into an art district. And much of the conversation around China in the period leading up to our founding, uh, basically from the, the, the late 1970s until the time around the Olympics, the Beijing Olympics in 2008, uh, often revolved around this idea that economic reform and growth would lead China to a new kind of political system and subjectivity. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic I sometimes called the great teleology of capitalism bringing democracy. And in this kind of a framework, the museum, especially coming from a Western perspective, has a very specific function, which is as a place, an institution dedicated to the cultivation and education of a democratic citizenry. Um, and of course, as we've seen in the years since 2008, specifically with the financial crisis uh, and all of the developments culminating most recently in, in COVID and the various responses uh, to it, China traveled a, a very different path. And that actually leads us to ask ourselves as an institution, what kind of role uh, we are left to play in this society. We see ourselves as a, a museum of contemporary art, a museum, of course, without a collection, in our case, a Kunsthalle, uh, a, a, a temporary museum in many ways, um, that, that sits outside of the, what I would call the two overarching narratives of political and consumer subjectivity. So we are neither an official nor a straightforwardly uh, economic or commercial space. We are instead a space for a kind of open and human encounter and a place in which through the presentation of objects and images by different artists, we attempt to articulate a kind of global worldview and subjectivity. Many institutions in the West are currently confronting questions around diversity and decolonization. Um, and these are, of course, conversations that we follow very, very closely and that we learn from and are inspired by as, as ingrained practices uh, and, and problems are, are addressed. However, this dynamic of decolonization applies quite differently to an institution that has no collection um, and that has already undergone this transition from its foreign owners to a new set of Chinese uh, trustees and backers and that throughout this whole period has managed to retain a kind of independence and to sit outside of the Communist Party system per se. It does, however, lead us to ask ourselves um, certain questions about what are our references and what are our benchmarks and how do we uh, attempt to improve ourselves as an institution um, functioning in this special context at this special time. Uh, to give a specific example, we closed our doors on January 19th for Chinese New Year and did not reopen until May 20th, you know, having been shut down as institutions all over the world later came to be uh, for what was here the core of the uh, pandemic period. Um, however, we were asked uh, starting in the middle of March, sort of with a, with a hint that we would be able to reopen in late May to organize an exhibition um, on very short notice. And using eight weeks, we put together a group show of, of 26 artists uh, of works uh, separated into different sections, reflecting in different ways on this global pandemic situation. Um, it was an interesting experience for us in, as an institution because for so many years, as we've evolved and matured in these 13 years that we've existed, we've always been attempting to extend our timelines and to implement more uh, what we consider kind of international best practices, uh, which would mean you know, starting to work on an exhibition uh, two or three or even four years in advance 
and approaching it uh, according to a very regimented timeline. Um, it was an interesting discovery for us that this Chinese condition of things happening very quickly, uh, uh, very at, at, uh, in a way at the last minute, uh, was actually for us a source of strength and power um, as we attempted to confront these unexpected circumstances. And something that I think is sort of in our DNA uh, of being able to do things uh, this quickly, if you compare it to something like a situation we saw just this week at the Whitney in New York, where another very quickly planned exhibition managed to set off uh, some unwanted questions uh, and to raise some uncomfortable dynamics. Um, another example I'd like to give is of an exhibition that we just opened a week ago uh, with the American painter Elizabeth Payton. Um, an artist who, like all of the foreign artists we choose to show, has a level of connection to the Chinese conversation um, through her love of stories and narratives, but also through her insistence on figurative painting, which is a trend in art making that has remained uh, key to certainly education and formation here uh, in a way that uh, for her, it, it was a, a more rebellious or not an, an obvious choice uh, coming out of New York in the, in the 1990s. Um, now, what's interesting about mounting an exhibition of Elizabeth Payton's work during the middle of a pandemic is that uh, the exhibition must be installed remotely. And paradoxically, although the artist cannot be present and is not able to engage with the audience and the media in the ways that we typically think of as good, it also endows the artwork itself with a new kind of power and significance. Um, as we look to the future, we think a lot about building a network across China. We're going to open another location in Shanghai at the end of the year. We currently also operate a second location by the beach in Beidaihe, about 300 kilometers from Beijing. And we have our eyes on a number of other cities uh, with the hopes of creating what's really a community of contemporary art uh, that exists as a string of institutions in major cities mounting top quality exhibitions but that also exists as a digital community of people engaging with and learning about artistic practices uh, through a series of courses, through um, a program of content, um, and through a set of interactions that's delivered and mediated um, by their phones, essentially. Um, what will this look like and how will it relate, not just to the people actually using it, but to this community and this society that's at once Chinese and global. And what lessons might that have for us uh, as global museum practitioners? That's what I'll share for the moment. And I look forward to seeing you all in my deep dive in a little while. So welcome dear participants. It is beautiful to have you with us from wherever you're following this deep dive with Kavita Singh, professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics of Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi that you already met in her earlier sprint. And Clementine Delis, associate curator of KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin, who will be our first responder for today. My name is Fabian. I will guide you through the deep dives today. We are happy that Kavita and Clementine are here with us and we'll take time to answer your questions. So thank, thank you too for being with us and a warm welcome. Uh, first of all, a short note on how you can actually participate in this deep dive. If you have a question, there are three ways to include them in this discussion. So the first one is via direct audio in this webinar. Please click on the raise your hand icon, which you can find in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. As soon as it's your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so you can ask your question directly. And as soon as you have asked it, we will turn off your audio again. If you prefer, you can also use the chat in this webinar, or you can also use our online form at campus.re-publica.com if you are following from a website or through YouTube. We will include those questions as well. So as we have little time, let's dive in and you can already start to send your questions. In the meanwhile, I will give the floor to Clementine for a brief reaction to Kavita's sprint. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Hello to Kavita, who I haven't seen for nearly 10 years. In fact, we met uh, at a conference in Delhi with Martin Roth and Hartwig Fischer, another major museum director mm -hmm. and uh, organized by the Wissenschaftskolleg. So it's wonderful to hear you speak now. And I would like to dive in as fast as I can before I ask you a question. I want to give a little bit of a survey of what you've said, if that's possible. I think um, what you do in your paper is that you begin with history and you will end with history. So you begin with the specificity of the Indian Museum. And I don't think so many people realize that there were museums in India prior to the colonial period. This is something uh, fascinating. But what is interesting about your talk is that you uh, show how uh, in a museum in Madras, in Chennai, for example, there were sometimes 70,000 people who came into the colonial museum and who recognized their access as indirectly or in a maybe in a very politicized way, depending on how they thought themselves, as a civic democratic position. And this is um, very unusual, even today. So I think that this question of the colonial museum needs to be addressed. In Africa, there were colonial museums that were being set up to engage um, the colonials who went out to make them understand how people could be governed, how people could be exploited. And these museums were being built at the same time as ethnographic museums were being built in Europe. We don't hear so much about these former colonial museums. So thank you for bringing that in. Um, the next point that really excites me is this idea of what you call a viewing situation. I would like us in, to think about the museum of the future, not necessarily as a discursive text-based, it is illustrative type of exhibitionary activity, but also as something that can promote different ways of visual thinking, different forms of visual thinking. Um, you then, because your paper is brilliant, you go into the question of real estate and gentrification. You say, okay, so maybe if Indian museums had a colonial kind of synchronicity, maybe later, after independence, much later, after the highlight of the Crafts Museum in Delhi, for example, uh, there was a sense where well, we have to catch up. The market is also catching up. We need to go fast, faster. And then you have this plethora of what you call signature buildings that are actually empty, that have become ghosts before they even lived. And we're going to see throughout the, the, the four presentations tonight that there is a, a constant coming back to the question of the prioritization of space. And very quickly, you do remember how when Jotrinda Jain opened the Crafts Museum in Delhi in whatever, late 50s, early 60s, he had studio spaces. Yes. Crafts people worked and probably lived in the museum. So this is important to remember. You speak about markets and collecting, and I understand the point about the radical, in your words, radical inequality and radical unfairness of any form of collecting, pretty much. Um, and really, I guess, any form of market, unless it's really a gift economy. Um, however, there is an, a kind of a uh, question mark there, which maybe we will be able to address later, and that is the relationship between existing collections the question of provenance and then the, the real no-no, the real kind of taboo, which is just deaccessioning. So when you speak about sharing and moving and Ashil Mbembe speaks about, you know, collections on the move, so to speak, we forget that we have to address the question of deaccessioning, which is very difficult. Then you say, well, what are we going to do? We're going to focus on history because history is where the museum can really engage uh, uh, actually quite a diverse public um, and we want to involve as many outside voices as possible so like you I also believe that a museum cannot be healed from the inside I think we need the external communities and you talk about the community of cooperation now my question to you is as follows you are you called yourself a museum observer and not a museum maker. maker. And yet you teach students. 
Students who should, in fact, be going out in life with the urge and the capacity and the competence to address the museums today in the 21st century. So I, my question is as follows. Number one, who are the agents of change? Who will activate all these different reformulations of the museum that you would wish for? The relationship between the university and the museum. How do you encourage your art history students to go beyond academia and the safe corridors? And can you bring them to actually want to step over the bureaucratic threshold of the museum and begin to transform them within the Indian context? So when you speak about the autonomy of the university and you would wish it for the autonomy of the museum, how does education and agency fit into this? Thank you. It's great to see you, Clementine. I wish I could reach into the screen and give you a hug. It's been so many years and it's so wonderful to see you once again. Uh, just very quickly to say that the questions, the specific questions that you've asked me, I'm afraid, uh, lead to very specific situations to do with India and even with my university, which I don't think necessarily are the questions we want to open out in a general audience, because I can tell you that historically in India, universities have tended to be left of center. That's not a surprise. That is the case in many, many places. But um, at the current moment, particularly, being left of center is a very dangerous place to be in. And so at this very moment, we are actually seeing things that I think the world has seen in Latin America, let's say, or in certain parts of Southeast Asia. We are seeing in India right now where uh, a lot of young student activists and a lot of politically engaged professors are finding every week more and more are being put in jail. Right. So under these circumstances today to actually imagine that our students could get a foot in the door and could use their awareness and their intelligence and their questioning minds from within the system is um, not going to work because specifically universities like my university or other such universities which carry a lineage of uh, left thinking are exactly the wrong place to be from to enter institutions today in India. And I'm saying this about India, but I'm sure there are residences in many parts of the world. There have been since the 1970s in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia and in Latin America, and they continue to be in many places. So that's partly why I was also imagining that if the institution of the museum is so ossified, then the public takes ownership of the museum, including those functions of the museum that the museum does not fulfill. And you could actually imagine this having resonance in other places as well. So, for example, instead of waiting for a conscientized curator from within the British Museum or from within the Louvre to extend an invitation to immigrant communities, if immigrant communities already have the right to buy a ticket and enter the museum, why can they not also articulate their viewpoints without the formal invitation from the institution, right? So in a sense, I am accepting that there is in many places a kind of a rightward drift, which means that these institutions of museums which are very much connected to national pride and therefore get locked into a position of service of the state may not have the power to reinvent themselves. And so there is a need to take agency and power from outside. I think that's what I was trying to say without being quite so blunt and direct about it. Okay. I, we have, uh questions coming in from uh -huh. our online tool at, at campus.reimaginaspublica.com and Krista Clark is asking what practical steps can be taken to the kind of collection sharing vision that you have shared? Um, well thank you very much for that. So I think one of the uh, good things about uh, the idea of collection sharing is that it uh, I hope 
uh, gets over that paranoia about deaccessioning, which Clementina had brought up, because a lot of museum uh, directors seem to have this fear that the idea of circulation means an idea of letting go, and it seems to get caught up in certain very entrenched positions, um, which are positions about property. You know, so the way we protect our property and our possessions. Yeah. Uh, uh, this sort of invites that kind of uh, reaction. So if it becomes a, a position of sharing and of circulation and of long-term loans and the acceptance that there is joint custody for five years, 10 years, 15 years for the foreseeable future for certain kinds of objects, I think it gets over a certain mental impediment. Where the, the harder thing to cross, and this is a really hard bridge to cross, but when we talk about decolonizing the museum, we have to talk about making the possibility of the museum accessible to a larger and larger uh, circle. And we have to recognize that a lot of the time, the things that we call best practices that we think we are promulgating in the service of heritage and its um, prolonged life are very exclusionary practices. So some of the conservation protocols that we apply, I, I know this is not a popular thing to say, but I really believe that a lot of the conservation protocols and the display protocols that we apply are actually designed to keep museums and exhibitions the exclusive province of a rich boys club and so actually again the hidden subtext of saying that we should share collections and circulate them is also that we have to let go of certain protocols about you know what is the appropriate climate what is the appropriate environment what are the appropriate standards of care who are the people who are appropriate to touch or handle or courier this object you know these things also have to change which would be the harder things to let go internally in the institution and the only good thing about it is because they are technical and they're internal in the institution, they can be sorted through internal debate rather than what hits the headlines when you say, oh, we're going to give the Elgin marbles back to Greece or we're not going to give the Elgin marbles back to Greece. The idea of transferring ownership and possession turns into a, a debate that everybody has an opinion about, whereas um, technical issues that have been long-standing impediments in circulation, I think, can be more quietly compromised upon. I would like to take one more question from the audience and by Natasha, before we have to finish this deep dive, because we have only two minutes left. What role do colonial museums play in the discussions about ethnographical museums? Where are the connections from the past, but also where are the connections in the current discussions? If you can... Uh, give that very brief answer to this very complex question? Well, it is a huge question, Natasha, and I'd like to actually sidestep it by saying that certainly in countries like ours in India, what we need to think about very deeply, and I think with a, an appropriate degree of shame, is the perpetuation of colonial structures within our museums today by us. So that those of us who happened to be in a position to capture mainstream power within our countries continued to exoticize and marginalize certain groups, even in the ways we celebrate them. And to me, there is nothing sadder and more shameful than an Indian museum that celebrates tribal art or tribal culture sitting in the middle of a district where the very same communities that produce the art or the customs or the artifacts that we think are so ingenious and wonderful, the very same communities are being driven out of the lands they live in because of redevelopment projects, are being uh, thrown out of uh, forest reserves that they used to traditionally have access to, or are being pushed into the kinds of uh, sectors of the economy where they do their labor with absolutely no uh, guarantee of compensation or any kind of security at all. You know, So what is actually happening to tribal people in our country, for instance, um, stands 
so starkly at a variance from the terms in which they are celebrated in these leftover colonial museums that we continue to keep open and just slightly renovate and refurbish. And no museum has place to talk about the actual tragic and terrifying reality of the experience of tribal people in India today. I'd rather reflect on uh, what, what we lack now, rather than think about the lacks we inherited 70 years ago. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk, for this very interesting deep dive as well. So thank you for taking your time, Kavita, to answer this question in detail. It was really wonderful to have you with us. I took a lot from it. And a warm digital applause to you. Many thanks to all of you participating in this session as well, and to our first responder, Clementine, who will remain with us for the next deep dive with Philip Chinari, which will begin in just about one minute on this very channel. You can stay tuned here and yeah, just stay with us for the next deep dive. Welcome back to all of you uh, to this second deep dive session. Um, welcome to all the new participants joining us for this session right now. We are very happy to have you with us. Um, we hope you are well and enjoyed the program so far. With us is now also Philip Tinari, whose sprint you already just heard, Director and Chief Executive at the UCCA Center for Contemporary Art, joining us from Beijing. And Clementine Delis, Associate Curator of the KW Institute for Contemporary Art, Berlin, our first responder. We if still, if you want to have a question, there are three ways to include them. Raise your hand through the, the webinar. You can find a button at the, at the bottom of your screen. Or if you prefer to ask your question directly through the chat, you can ask it directly on by typing it in. Or you can also use our online form at campus.re-publica.com if you are following from our website or YouTube. So let's dive in. Clementine, I would like to ask you to give you the floor and ask for your first statement. And please unmute your microphone. Yeah. I'm unmuted. Perfect. Good evening, Philip. Thank you for your presentation. I was intrigued by the fact that you began by saying immediately, look, the future is not technology. It's not VR. It's not interactivity. It's something else. Uh, maybe we can get there. I think it's really important to try and uh, maybe even, even, even if it's quite difficult to understand exactly what the future will be, that we try and get there as quickly as possible and with as much imagination as possible. Um, you spoke about how UCCA Con uh, Museum of Contemporary Art or Contemporary Art Center, Center of Contemporary Art, how whilst it was established by a European, a Belgian, um, Guy Allens, 
became then not only a Chinese venue, but something that had undergone a form of decolonial process. So the, the fact that the management is now in the hands of the Chinese and or it's an international plus Chinese management in your in your in your presentation, you seem to stress that the decolonial would have uh, not only a different feature within the Chinese context, but also within your center of contemporary art. And you suggest that the financial crisis in 2008 and now more recently COVID-19, the pandemic have both helped to stimulate the shift, maybe even to accelerate it. And you um, speak about the, the question of, uh, you give two examples, right, of how this has now begun to change the way that you're thinking about what you're doing in the space of the use of um, your art center. And you speak also, like Kavita, about the question of best practices. And the first best practice that causes um, slight kind of vibe is that you managed to make an exhibition in eight weeks rather than planning it two to four years ahead, which is best practice, right? And uh, again, with another exhibition, the one of Elizabeth Payton, you show how it is actually possible to install virtually or at a remote remote distance um, and how in a way this gives agency to the artwork that might not have been quite as in or evoked in this particular way if you had had Elizabeth in the space installing with you so that it changes in a way the way we're going to start looking at art, at artworks my question to you has really got to do with the relationship between capital and radical vulnerability as a museum director and on the other hand, and quite actually quite parallel to that, internationalism and autonomy. You say uh, that you say, I quote, we are a space for an open human encounter. You say that you would like to build a network to create a community of contemporary art that exists as a string of institutions, but also as a digital community. And you mentioned that UCCA has a space called Dune, where it has a lot to do with the sea and the land, and that you're creating a new location in Shanghai. So my questions are really to do with the we, the we in a kind of post-decolonial context as well that you mentioned. So how do you imagine the network? What about the ownership of the network? What about the decision-making, the, the maybe deviant best practices of decision-making? Could you tell us a bit about the patrons, the investors, sure. and the compromises you have to deal with? So when you're speaking about, we are a space for an open human encounter, who has the right to claim subjectivity in this museum or in this contemporary art center? And is there actually a form of decolonial that needs to take place that is perhaps actually hasn't even begun, that is more complex and site-specific? Sure. Yeah, thank you. I mean, those are all um, very incisive and uh, fraught questions, as is this context. And, uh, you know, as is the even the idea of being an American in China uh, on the most basic level at this you know, moment of decoupling and, um, and friction. Um, I guess to this question of the we, which I, I tend to use as this sort of shorthand, uh, because I'm kind of working from a place of a lot of assumptions of having, you know, been become fluent in this language and functional in this culture and having been here for approaching 20 years with you know a, a, a deep trajectory of research and encounter with with um, all kinds of people on the ground um, and and yeah the process that I did outline was was a shift from you know a single owner uh, with an acquisitive kind of urge and you know along with Uli Sig kind of the other great collector of the 90s um, at a moment before there were institutional actors or really major even economic actors in the contemporary art space in China um, to something different. And the something different, you know, is, is not just different from what it was before, but um, what, you know, different from how things are in, in, in your American context, um, you know, this kind of basic assumption, at least the American context, which I is the one I know the next best of 
you know, a board who can hold an institution in a public trust kind of on behalf of the society uh, is not really a, a model that that is viable here because the only organization uh, empowered to do that is the Communist Party. Um, and so in a strange way, private ownership becomes a proxy for public participation or for I mean, of course, it comes down to different definitions of the public, but this is getting to what I meant by a kind of open, uh, a more open space. You know, we strive to be the kind of place where you, uh, as someone entering, um, are are not uh, the object of a political ideology and are not the object of a um, a sort of advertising ideology or a commercial um, a commercial program, but rather are treated as you know a thinking individual who may um, engage with and draw their own conclusions from, or, or make their own critiques of, or find their own ways of engaging with what we uh, as and I, there I speak for the staff and the curators and you know the best practices the different departments of the of the institution have decided to put forth um, for you. Um, so who has the right to claim subjectivity? I mean, hopefully as many people as possible. Unfortunately, not being a, uh, a subsidized state institution, we do need to charge a, a ticket fee because that's sort of one of the main channels by which we survive. Something we try very adamantly to offset with all kinds of outreach programs to uh, different schools and different underserved communities at both near us but also in other parts of china through trying to send curricula and other other programs abroad um i i think in the end you know actually as much as the international or the global is starting to seem outdated or i say in some ways it's still something to be fought for in this particular context where i think the um the basic urge is more towards a very a uh, sinocentric narration of events and so to kind of claim that space for internet for kind of international dialogue and for um a, a way of looking at the world and the art world that's grounded in beijing or in a, a so-called chinese perspective but that also has room for lots of other things um seems to be what our viewers you know through the research we've done on them tend to value uh, most and and what we're able to offer Okay, I would like to take one question that came in through our online tool at campus.dream-publica.com. Um, and how far did the behavior of audience or the participants at the, at the exhibition change? So, yeah, how did, how, what is your experience with that? Uh, As you were trying I'm to say, to include more uh, social groups, I think. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's an ongoing um, campaign. I mean, that's something one can always do more of, but, um, you know, we try to come at it from the perspective of raising awareness, but also from very specific engagements with, with, with different groups and constituencies. Um, you know, just to give a very small example, uh, we have a, a docent, a woman in her 70s, who's become something of an internet sensation because people in China are, are simply not used to individuals uh, belonging to that generation, people with direct experience of the kind of 49 to 79, you know, more socialist period, even being interested in or engaged with contemporary art. Whereas, you know, that's a demographic that in a lot of other contexts is kind of at the core of the, uh, the docent uh, constituency, if you will. So I think there's, there's a certain way in which, um, you're trying to create unexpected situations and ask people to examine them. And we have one question coming in through our online tool uh, by Andreas, who was asking, how was your working experience different in this quick exhibition making? I mean, it's, it's uh, and this is a bit what Kavita was saying as well, but I mean, to, to sort of suspend uh, things that are in other moments taken as absolute requirements can be absolutely liberating. Um, which is not to say that you you lower your standards, just that you try to meet them in different ways. Uh, and you know, as we're using Zoom now for a panel discussion, a lot can be done to install a show over over a video chat. Um, if we start to think about our you know lower carbon footprint future, it may mean that to install a, a video 
installation or uh, other kinds of work as well, one might not need to send a few assistants or couriers to uh, around the world specifically for that purpose. But maybe there are, you know, we can be a bit more intentional about the ways that we use international travel in the future. Um, and I guess, you know, connected to that, what I was also, what I was really trying to say about, about the Peyton show, uh, it, not that it wouldn't have been better to have her there in person, but that the idea that the object is somehow um, the privileged subject, right? Is the object is the one that can cross the border and the one that, um, that that can instantiate itself across a context kind of gives it even even more power and, and that was definitely also true as we made uh meditations in an emergency maybe clementine to get back to your um point maybe you can also describe how you try to make less co2 uh, uh co and try to be more sustainable in your ways of making an exhibition and on your way of curating so for i mean i i'm associate curator at kw and actually what i'm doing is um backstage so i'm not curating an exhibition i am bringing together people from different disciplines because we need to talk we need to understand what these venues are are going to do in the in the future. Maybe they're not going to just produce exhibitions. Maybe art, art will have will require a different platform, a different type of engagement. And perhaps we are going to enter into a, a moment when the I don't know the the slight chaos caused by COVID and the and the effects on the market and the effects on the consumer led. Um, distribution of museums in the world today will require for smaller venues to provide sheltering structures for artists and people who are associated with their role in society and their changing role in society to come together. So I was very interested in your idea of this network of smaller or maybe not smaller, but this network of UCCAs within China, because I'm curious and maybe you could respond to that, Philip to understand scale, the parameter of a project like this. Are we talking about uh, something that I'm working on with Azun Wagbogu in Lagos? Are we talking about a home museum, something very small and domestic? Or are we talking about a museum which is the size of, I don't know, um, a forest? You know, what are the, what are the, what is the par parameter of the museum of the future? Maybe you can take make your answer very brief as we have only 30 seconds left in this very interesting conversation. I'm sorry. Sure. I think um, I think one should should be able to play with scale in different ways. You know, you see in Beijing is 10,000 square meters. You see it doing is is 500 um, and Shanghai will be uh, uh, 4,000. Uh, so it's um, and, and I mean, so since we only have 30 seconds, that's still only the most direct way of talking about this. But I think it's it's much more about in trying to instantiate through different kinds of spaces, different kinds of practices, different kinds of programs and exhibitions, um, a, a, an overall uh, con concept, idea, attitude um, f about you know what is art and what, what can it do. Okay, so thank you for the steep dive as well, Philippe Tinari, for taking the time to answer the question. It was great to have you with us. Clementine will be with us for the next deep dive as well with Selvira Trigulova, whose sprint you are about to hear. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the Mars program.
dear colleagues, friends, friends and collaborators of uh, Martin Road. For me, it's a pleasure and an honor to have the chance uh, to address to you during the second Martin Road uh, Symposium. And going through very complicated times now, I always think that we miss him tremendously uh, because uh, his advice would be really very helpful uh, today. What I would like to speak about is what we are doing now internationally. Uh, now, uh, at the time of uh, uneasy political situation and very complex situation in the world due to the COVID. Um, and we learned a lot during those months uh, of uh, quarantine, each of us, but what we learned, I think, uh, the most is how important it is to be connected to be connected internationally, how we need communication, communication, the virtual one, but communication with open heart, open mind, and with a desire to share uh, your own achievements, your own uh, experience during that uh, situation. And uh, when even United Europe was closing its borders, uh, I felt that we need to strengthen our international cooperation because even earlier uh, with uh, complex uh, political times, uh, culture was always building the bridges, those bridges which politicians were burning down. And today uh, it's even more important to feel that we are part of one and the same world and to understand uh, that uh, we share same ideas, we're facing same problems and dilemmas, same dramas and tragedies uh, even uh, uh, to that uh, extent. Uh, so uh, notwithstanding all those problems which we are all facing, now we are trying and even strengthening our international uh, program. Uh, with the first uh, possibility of uh, having exhibition exchange, we are sending now, for example, our Chagalls to the exhibition to Italy due to open in mid-September. Uh, we are working days and nights on two great projects, uh, which we do together with German colleagues. Uh, one of them is a um, unique exhibition, uh, Dreams of Freedom, Russian and German Romanticism, which we are working on uh, together with the State Museums of Dresden. State Museums of Dresden, where Martin Roth was a director general for many years and reshaped this uh, institution. And uh, it's really a unique attempt to focus on those achievements and those revelations which were made during the Romantic time the sense of freedom, the sense of inner freedom, the sense of inner freedom of the artist. And if you think carefully through our uh, today's existence, our today's uh, artistic experience, I think we very well understand that all those categories in which we live, and especially the category of artistic individualism, were born in romantic times. And we are born due, during the period of political uh, freedom, which followed Napoleonic uh, uh, wars. We are examining uh, major issues, major questions uh, reflected in Russian and German romantic art. And Russian and German art was very closely connected uh, at that uh, time. And at the same time, we are referring to today's situation and every chapter or section of that journey through uh, romantic uh, concept uh, is um, at the end having a statement of the great contemporary artist, uh, Bill Viola or Gerhard Richter or younger artists who had inherited 
those romantic concepts and who in the world which is so different from romantic times still share those uh, ideas so it's an inner dialogue between those times and contemporary vision and uh, i was so happy uh, when we managed to get uh, one of the greatest contemporary architects daniel liebeskind to be the architect of the show both in moscow and in dresden i had a chance to work with him in berlin on berlin moscow in 95 and it was a unique experience which i hope we will repeat uh, uh, with this exhibition which we were unfortunately to postpone from october to december but uh, it's all going uh, on and we are very much looking forward to have it another great exhibition which we are doing now and which is due to open in uh, uh, november in mid november is exhibition about contemporary europe about um europe uh which is facing very serious problems and conflicts about Europe, uh, which was and still is unfortunately facing COVID infection, uh, about Europe, which is national and global at the same uh, time. Uh, it's a unique uh, statement and it's a unique concept of bringing together more than 80 living artists, beginning with the greatest names like Anselm Kiefer or uh, um, um, Gerhard Richter and many others, French artists like uh, Annette Messager, ending up with comparatively young artists. And uh, this exhibition will represent artists uh, from uh, more than 30 countries, Russia now uh, including. Uh, and we were very happy that a group of uh, young Lithuanian artists, which got the Golden Lion during the last Venice Biennial, um, will join us and will be part of that uh, project, which is going under the patronage of three presidents, President of Russia, President of Germany and President of France, and is due to be shown later in Berlin and uh, in uh, uh, Paris. Uh, and romantic exhibition will travel to Dresden in uh, uh, summer. So this cooperation, this permanent exchange of thoughts, experiences, um, ideas, uh, a very sincere and deep and open discussions, because again, um, the enemy is the same. This uh, tendency towards splitting everything apart, towards building the walls and borders, towards um, enclosing yourself in an enclosed space uh, with uh, unsurpassable borders between you and the world. It stimulates incredible, uh, in, it stimulates in incredible intensification of uh, uh, all of our efforts to be united, to be joined, to be uh, common. And that's something which Martin Roth was so much uh, looking for, working for, fighting for. And I remember during our dialogue in Moscow, when he was asked who you are, a German at the head of uh, the most British of the British Museum, Victor and Albert Museum, he answered, I'm European, and that's the answer. We are the people of the world, and I'm ready to answer any of your uh, questions uh, during our further discussions. Greeting friends and colleagues in Germany and beyond. I'm delighted to join you from my home in Boston in the United States, where I teach at Tufts University, located on what was once the land of the Wampanoag. Here is my question. 
How can Western art museums, with their historical collections, inherited taxonomies, and aesthetic hierarchies, undertake meaningful change in response to social justice movements? I would like to share some thoughts on how these moment, movements pose challenges to the way American art in particular is represented in art museums in the United States, especially the well-established museums on the East Coast. For those of you elsewhere, this may seem a provincial story. Yet, of course, the decolonized movement is everywhere, and perhaps what I say may have relevance to you. Here in the US, decolonize signifies a fundamental discontent with the implicit and explicit biases of our cultural institutions. With respect to museums, it addresses the assumptions, hierarchies, and omissions that have long governed the acquisition, classification, and exhibition of objects and the stories they are made to tell. What I want to do today is to point to certain structural obstacles to greater inclusivity in those domains. Needless to say, the push for equity and inclusion, which carries a moral conviction and the momentum of generational change, poses significant challenges to all backward-looking museums. But I would argue art museums face an especially difficult challenge because from the beginning, they have propagated an elite conception of art that has naturalized overlapping hierarchies of aesthetic and social values in ways that limit more representative object-based storytelling. Simply put, you can't tell diverse stories without socially and aesthetically diverse objects. These embedded hierarchies dictate not only what is collected, but how it is exhibited. In effect, inscribing and mapping privilege, as well as its absence, onto the physical space of the museum. The inevitable outcomes of this bias are unfortunately palpable and problematic in the representation of American art within traditional American art museums. The origin of the problem goes back to the birth of the American Art Museum, which sought to incorporate the high art gallery guided by aesthetic quality and the European canon, and the cultural history museum based on German and Swiss prototypes. Over time, cultural history was absorbed into the dominant high art museum and in the process of assimilation, only historical objects deemed to be of superior aesthetic quality were regarded as worthy of collection. Drawing on elite objects, the American galleries of museums in Boston, New York, and elsewhere were molded into a patriotic narrative of moral and military ascent from the first colonial settlements in the 1600s to political and artistic maturity in the American Revolution and early Republic. This mythic origin story suited both museum patrons and administrators who saw their own family histories embodied in the art and architectural fragments brought together in period ensembles. Only objects they considered masterpieces legitimized their hereditary claims to elevated taste while also demonstrating native artistry on a par with British achievement. Not surprisingly, the heroic tale of colonial evolution came with no recognition of how the colonies in turn colonized indigenous lands and subjugated its people. The arts of Native Americans were nowhere in sight. For traditional American collections wanting to revise these still mostly intact narratives, two strategies have lately been pursued. First, existing works of art may be given new labels with contextual information about subject and ownership. At the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts, for example, colonial portraits now have additional labels revealing connections to the transatlantic slave trade. The problem with this approach is that it can only achieve inclusion in a negative way by representing marginalized people as both subjugated and absent. A second, more affirming strategy entails opening museum hierarchies 
to include non-elite objects made by and of underrepresented people. In other words, what has traditionally been classified as folk or vernacular art. Recent, exa recent examples of taxonomic expansion include the purchase by the Metropolitan Museum of anonymous studio portraits of African Americans from the 1940s and the acceptance of a gift of recent so-called outsider art. It remains to be seen how these objects end up being used in permanent collections, which are still largely governed by distinctions between high and low art. I should add that in 2018, the first Native American art was shown at the Met. The hierarchical mapping of different art forms and visual traditions onto the physical space of the museum may be clearly seen in the new Art of the Americas wing at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. When it opened just 10 years ago, it was praised for offering a more sensitive and inclusive vision of American art. That it already seems in need of revision shows how quickly the cultural landscape is shifting. The boldest innovation of the wing was to go beyond European-inspired art of the United States to feature the visual culture of Latin America and Native Americans, justifying the plural Americas in its title. However, the placement of Latin and Native material on the lowest level below ground to suggest historical precedence and perhaps rootedness in the American soil subtly reinforced the marginalization and primitivizing of those cultures dating back to the early 20th century. The main floors above are given over to an impressive historical survey of colonial art and its legacy, represented by high style painting, sculpture, furniture, silver, etc., for which the museum is best known. Period environments frame portraits of Boston's illustrious revolutionaries and the luxury goods that ornamented their lives. Yet if one penetrates deeper into the America's wing, away from the main axis of power, you find an equally exceptional collection of folk art, which includes paintings and domestic objects made by women and artists of color. Though folk art and the art of the elite are contemporaneous, the two represent different social and aesthetic spheres and are as segregated spatially in the museum as their makers were in life. Prioritization of museum space is a key metric of exclusion. One solution to the problem of representation in traditional American galleries with their period decor would be to wipe them clean and start over. And one dramatic instance of such an effort may be found at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, where a set of installations titled The Many Voices of Colonial America show us the way. To give one example, period rooms from South Carolina acquired to showcase elite colonial taste have been transformed through the incorporation of Cherokee and African objects labeling in video commentary by living community members into a multi-sensory tableau revealing a complex history of intersecting lives and culture. The museum webpage declares, now other voices are heard in these rooms telling their own stories. These newly modified rooms offer a bold vision of what a reimagined past might offer the future of the American Art Museum. I'm not able to show you these spaces in this talk, but I encourage you to go online and check them out for yourselves. And I look forward to conversation in the deep dive that follows. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you very much for this kind invitation. I'm really pleased to be able to give this short talk for you. What has made a lasting impression on me over the last few weeks are the words of a media artist friend of mine. I simply wanted to know what he is doing. 
And then I was extremely surprised that he was doing really well, that he probably coped with the whole situation better than I did. He said to me, you know, we artists have always been the precariat. We are not really worse off now than before. We are masters of improvisation. And creative rethinking is also not difficult for us. And as an a media artist, I was sitting in front of the computer at home most of the time. So, so home office and quarantine don't bother me either. I was surprised, and his words gave me hope. That something new would emerge from this disruptive moment that forces us all to rethink. Of course, the new does not necessarily have to be better, but the new offers new possibilities that we can use. And we should do that, because one thing is clear, things could not go on as they were. And so COVID-19 was a stress test for so many areas and also accelerated many things. Digitalization in Germany has also received a major boost in any case, because stores without online stores, schools and museums without digital offerings were suddenly gone. And gun from consciousness, detached from its visitors, condemned to its insignificance, that must not happen to museums, especially in such difficult times. Museums have to fight for their relevance, show that they are important third places, detached from everyday stress and the pressure of consumption, and that they, even if they work in the field of art history, act in the here and now. And for me, this means to understand digitalization not only as digital topics that are dealt with in exhibitions and events, but to live digitality. That means to transfer all the achievements of digital modernism to the art and culture business. Just like empowerment and participation. To understand your visitors as members of your community and to actively integrate them into the program. To form bonds, to turn visitors into citizen councils that decide on collections. To turn visitors into curators that decide on exhibition projects. And this is exactly what we are experimenting within our project nextmuseum.io. It's a platform for crowd creation and co-creation together with the Museum Ulm supported by the Kulturstiftung des Bundes and Weisheim Foundation. Museums are increasingly characterized by a shared experience. They themselves become novel platforms, interactive places of communication, integration and knowledge transfer. Furthermore, they should make cultural participation possible for all groups of society. That is why we started with nextmuseum.io, a movement for more democracy in the art world. And we want to develop new formats and digital prototypes for education, mediation and communication with the visitor. We are testing new ways of creating exhibitions via swarm intelligence. And the results are then presented and debated in the participating museums. And we invite all interested institutions to use the platform to implement collaborative exhibitions and practices in their own houses or take the field of cultural education. We need more critical art education practices that are sometimes provocative, sometimes reflective, sometimes subversive. An important question here is, who should actually teach whom? And how can we learn something that does not yet exist? Of course, more diversity and less Eurocentrism in the program is very important. In the old internal structures, but of course, in museums, also in the collection. Who is missing at the table? What is not to be seen in the collection and why? Can be guiding questions here. Finally, remote and agile work, less travel, more digital tools and less paperwork. These are also current achievements. And museums need to be closer, respond faster and be easy to reach. Long live direct communication. Social media, WhatsApp and Telegram also do this. But cancel culture on the other extreme is toxic. A digital mob that believes it is morally right and is screaming for vigilante justice. Which monument is still justified today? 
What about the aura of the digital? Who owns the digital commons? Societies negotiate permanently. Things are in flux. Through the digital as fast as never before. And negotiations are taking place on all channels. That can sometimes be very exhausting. But you have to anticipate these changes because never before these negotiations have been conducted with such passion, especially in the cultural field. Museums have to be careful that they don't become battlefields but spaces for constructive dialogue. And unfortunately, in many museums, still a taboo, entertainment and humor. Dear colleagues, do not take yourself too seriously. The visitor is not interested in 100 years of art history. He and she simply wants to spend a nice hour with you. We should talk about the customer journey in the museum. We should start using data we have from our visitors to make the program even better. German television 10 years ago was quite a catastrophe. Always the same ideas, formats, actors and suddenly streaming providers that Netflix came on the market. And today, Netflix production win prizes in Cannes. And Netflix spent $17 billion on in-house productions this year. The creatives and actors are happy, the production companies and the viewers are happy, because above all, the overall quality of the productions became much better. And that's exactly what I hope for the dinosaurs among the museums that they don't die out, because this would be fatal, but that the new digital possibilities also give them new creative energy, new partners, that new hybrid formats emerge, and that digitalization also enters the exhibition business. There are already historical reconstructions of Documenta 1 in virtual reality. There are great sculptures in augmented reality. There are artificial intelligence that create exhibitions and create artworks. There are bots as new audio guides, video workshops for children and guided tours on the desktop. But let's not forget the people in all these human-machine interactions. Museums are neither temples of consumption, nor of technology, nor of wellness. They are places to argue and polarize, to surprise and inspire and sometimes love in digital as well as in the analog form. Thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to your questions and the panel discussion. See you soon. So welcome dear participants, welcome to this third deep dive today and, and welcome especially to you Servira Tregulova, Director of the State Tretiakov Gallery Moscow, who just held her sprint, who you could just hear, and Clementine Delis, Associate Curator of KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin, our first responder who is still with us. We are very happy that Servira and Clementine are with us and we, I would like to uh, tell you again how you can actually participate in this deep dive. If you have a question, there are three ways to include them in this discussion. The first one is via direct audio in this webinar. So if you are a participant to this webinar, you can also click, you can raise your hand, click the small button, and as soon as it is your turn, I will call you by name and enable your audio. Please unmute yourself so that you can ask your question as soon as you have used you asked it, we will turn off your audio again and your video won't be used, so no worries about that. If you prefer, you can also ask the question in writing in the chat in this webinar or you use our online tool at campus.re-publica.com, campus.re-publica.com if you are following from a website or through YouTube. We will include those questions as well. So we have little time and Clementine, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to uh, speak to you, Zelfira, and thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I retain the, the question of building bridges. And I remember Martin Roth, who you uh, evoked so passionately or with such great affection, 
um, as somebody who was involved in large exhibitions and um, you across borders, across territories, and you spoke a lot about the question of the international program. And you mentioned two major big exhibitions that you're involved in, uh, in setting up with uh, Germany as well, but also France. And this is Dreams of Freedom, the Russian German Romantic movements and uh, the question of artistic individualism at this point in time which is extraordinary and it opens in Moscow in December and in the summer in Dresden. The second exhibition is a group show with 80 artists who are going to somehow, I guess, address questions of Europe, of conflict, of borders, of COVID-19. And you have both relatively young artists and artists of a generation, let's say, that also experienced the blockbuster. And this is what I want to try and kind of talk to you about and hear your thoughts on this. So you um, mentioned at the end of your speech that uh, we, you said, are the people of the world. But when I teach students, I don't feel that I'm the person of the world. I feel that they are the people of the world. And um, I think that the question of how to strengthen an international alliance between artists and exhibition makers, curators and museums and institutions on whatever scale is something uh, that actually the young generation is going to articulate more than us. And so I do wonder, and this is what I want to ask you about, and that is in the current climate, the political and economic climate, is a blockbuster actually about foreign policy? You know, uh, is the blockbuster uh, still a project that will enhance um, democratic understanding, that is capable of crossing borders? Do you think it's uh, the right model for a COVID-19 world? I don't even want to say post-COVID. And there, I have to ask you because you are the director of the National Museum in Moscow, uh, what role political negotiation plays in your curatorial programming? I mean, you mentioned that three presidents are involved in the second large exhibition, Macron, um, Frau Merkel, and um, Herr, Mr. Putin, right? So I, I'm interested in understanding, on the one hand, the role of foreign policy in the Museum of the Future, and on the other hand, the question of, I don't want to say it, but it's capital. Do we have to make blockbuster exhibitions to bring in people to make sure we have funding from the state? So could you perhaps address this for me, please? Please unmute your microphone because we can't hear you at the moment. Sorry. Uh let me start uh, with the question related to the role of uh, politics uh, and foreign ministry. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, great. Uh, because I'm, I'm the worst person to deal with uh, um, iPads, iPhones, computers, and now I'm on vacations having just an old iPad in front of me. Uh, so, uh, speaking about uh, politics, uh, it's interesting that both exhibitions we are talking about right now, and I will go then further answering your question about blockbusters, because it's a very interesting one, but uh, it's not by coincidence that uh, both exhibitions are highly supported by the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Dreams of Freedom, uh, Romanticism in Germany and Russia uh, is uh, um, in very serious level funded by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany. Uh, it's a special grant which was given to our colleagues in Dresden and which is shared for the Moscow and Dresden uh, venue. Uh, and uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs is also uh, incredibly supportive of the second project we are talking about. Um, usually, usually, uh, at least during those five years when I'm a director of the Tretzikov, 
um, exhibitions are not funded by the state. Exhibitions at the Tretikov are almost always funded by private sponsors. We have a special fundraising department, we're at the one, and the one where art historians work, not just professional fundraisers. And also we have a special foundation for the support of the Tretikov Gallery. We're in fact raising 24% of our annual budget. And it's mainly used for exhibitions and some special projects, public programs, educational programs, etc., etc. Uh, so for us, it's unusual that the Minister of Foreign Affairs is supporting the exhibition, and that's that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany um, is supporting an exhibition in uh, uh, Russia. Uh, let me go back to the issue of bridges because you touched upon many uh, questions. Mm, I'm, I cannot like hesitate and not to quote uh, our president um, who spoke to uh, museum people and to the audience of the St. Petersburg Cultural Forum two or three years ago, I don't remember exactly. Um, he addressed us and said, uh, we both politicians and you museum directors and curators are, are dealing with the same uh, thing with the bridge, uh, the bridges. So we politicians are burning the bridges down and you are re-erecting them. And then again come we politicians and we're burning those bridges down and you again re-erect them. I think it's a very thoughtful uh, quotation and that's one of the answers. Uh, what is politics doing with these two big Russian, German, Russian, European uh, exhibitions? Going back to blockbusters, it's really an interesting uh, uh, issue. Um, I'm a director of the Tretikov for five and a half years. And uh, during uh, those five and a half years, I'm not counting this year, uh, because of COVID, obviously, uh, we enlarged our audience and made it more than twice bigger. And we became famous for our uh, big exhibitions, uh, big exhibitions of Russian art, uh, uh, big exhibitions, which you may call blockbuster. I hate this word, by the way. Um, and here I want to address uh, the issue which was raised in the speech of uh, the previous speaker who was broadcasted just before we uh, started, that we should go to the broadest audience possible. It's a very complex thing to make a big exhibition, a serious statement reevaluating the art of this or that artist or this or that uh, period, making it based on a very thorough scientific research and at the same time make it accessible, understandable for the widest uh, audience. This also means that you should turn your face to the audience and think not only about minutest details and specifics of your scientific research, you should do a research which then can be a founding ground for a very interesting public uh, project exhibition, which in fact here today, um, I think it should be called Blockbuster. Uh, it's becoming an immersive show because we are using not only art, which we are presenting, we are using the art of the architect, which is building, uh, up uh, this uh, exhibition, we are um, based. We are based on the creative concept of curators. We are discussing many things with the artists. If this is an exhibition of the living uh, uh, artist, um, and um, the results were mm, quite obvious for us. Uh, we had exhibitions with the attendance, uh, like 600,000 visitors, 500,000 visitors. 
Um, and also you were saying that we are a museum of national art and at the I'm, same time we are yes yeah, sorry i would like to uh, to also include a question that came from the audience because i think it fits quite well to what you just stated about uh, how uh, popular museums should be because um andreas was asking through the chat um as martin Roth was also uh, very fond of being popular how do we make museums popular when popular also means nationalist in many countries no not at all not at all not at all i'm so much against that idea and that uh, concept because populous means uh, uh, people and we will now get back to where we did start uh who we are the people of the world i feel myself to be a people of the world a person of the world also having in mind that I was growing up in Soviet Union, where the idea that I will see Florence or will stand in the middle of the Louvre or Metropolitan Museum, uh, the possibility of that was more or less equal of the possibility of seeing the backside of the moon. Yes. Uh, and I think that uh, you are right that uh, young people today, many of them, at least those ones who are not under nationalistic uh, influence they are considering themselves people uh, of the world with uh, no uh, borders and uh, you remember uh, this uh, uh, famous song uh, um, um, the, of the world where there will be no borders the song with which if i'm not mistaken exhibition revolution uh, um, uh, uh, was ending up with uh, that exhibition which was the first the last exhibition inaugurated by Martin Roth as a director of Victoria and Albert uh, Museum you know it's, it's it's a very sensitive issue to be popular and not populistic yes. so I can say about our projects we managed to be very popular but not populistic nor nationalistic and also speaking about national museum presenting exhibitions of european art of foreign art uh, when our uh, father founder pavel tritikov a private merchant and we are the only huge russian museum which was founded not by the government or by the czar but by a private person who from the very beginning had an idea of creating a museum of national art so when he donated his a uh, uh, gallery uh, to the city of Moscow in 1892. He presented Russian art, which he collected. He had almost 3,000 artworks. Sorry to Next to the collection of his brother, <laughs> who collected uh, Western European art. So we, from the very beginning, we're showing Russian art in the context of European art, uh, including Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and only after um the revolution to an end? elections were split okay yeah <laughs> i'm sorry i finish i finish yeah. answering the question which was asked yeah thank you very much uh, we are already have to come to an end unfortunately uh, we didn't have yeah. uh, time to ask all the questions thank you very much for your time for yeah. uh, participating in this deep dive uh, we will have the next deep dive with andreas andrew mcleulon excuse me um Clementine, who was our first responder, will remain with us. And we will start the next deep dive in just about one minute on this very channel. And thank you very much again for your time. See you. Thank you. It was my pleasure and honor.
So welcome back to all participants and welcome to the new participants joining us for this session right now. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We hope you are well and enjoying the program so far. With us now is Andrew McLean, Professor of Art History at Tufts University and still with us is Clementine Delis, Associate Curator of KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin, our first responder. You still have the same possibilities to join our deep dive. If you have a question, you can still raise your hand and ask your question through the audio function of this webinar. I will call you by name and you can ask your question. If you prefer, you can also use the chat function of this webinar or you use our online form at campus.re-publica.com. If you are following from a website or YouTube, you are welcome to use this tool as well. We will include those questions, of course. So let's begin. You can already start to send your questions. In the meanwhile, I will give the floor to Clementine for a quick reaction to the sprint. Thank you. Andrew, um, thank you very much for your incredibly interesting presentation. All the four have been, all four presentations are very stimulating. I noticed that like Kavita Singh, you teach art history, whereas the two other speakers are actually engaged in running either a venue, a Kunsthalle type venue or a museum. So it's quite an interesting contrast. And the last um, public question came from somebody who was interested in the question of how do we make museums popular without falling onto a kind of a nationalist grid or a nationalist matrix, I guess, of what a museum should be. And I think this question of the civic is very important. And I hope that we can come to that because right at the start of your talk, you speak about museums and social justice movements. Uh, this is really now the most burning issue that we have. How do we deal with the decolonial? And you quite rightly trace it back also to the formation of a, uh, I don't like high and low, it's a very 80s terminology, but you know what I mean, this high and low folk and uh, high art, um, artists uh, or artists who are named, who come from Europe and Western countries, or civilizations uh, and artists who don't need to have authorship or copyright or anything, but are you know part of our understanding of government, international government, colonial government. And um, what is important is this contrast that you raise between the fine art museum and how it can contextualize, how it can present an argument through its exhibitions and the Cultural History Museum that feels that it needs to contextualize its exhibits. And so since the 80s, again, there's been this fairly numbing polarization between the pedestal power of the Fine Art Museum with the spotlight on the artwork that we, we kind of know who it is. If not, then it's at least it's tribal art, if you see what I mean, if you're dealing with Africa. And on the, or, yeah, and on the other side, you have the ethnographic exhibition. And out of this, even 30 years or 50 years later, we have to deal with an inherited, propagated form of classification that's very, very difficult to break. And, uh, you know, the taxonomic management, you speak about taxonomic management and the ta taxonomic managers are effectively in great part custodians, the people who are the experts of the collections. Um, and I think we should remember, just a short aside, we shouldn't forget that collections are still being built from parts of the world that were subjected to colonial um, domination. These are usually archives or photography. So there isn't, it's not like it's finished and that, you know, now everything is over and we've got a better sense of what we should or should not be collecting. There's still a, a, a search for life's unknowns, for things that can be produced that will help us to understand why we live how as we do. Um, so you speak specifically about structural change. You reference the issue of the decolonial, of the non-represented peoples through their artifacts. And you say, and I quote, you can't tell diverse stories without aesthetically and socially diverse objects. So again, we come back to what Philip Tanari men mentioned earlier when he I hope we're coming back to this idea that objects can cross borders. Nonetheless, they need to have, if you like, the representation of different voices, of several voices. 
And you um, make a very important statement, which I'd like you to respond to now. And th this is, I'll come to my question, but the, you say that the prioritization of museum space is the key metric of exclusion. Now, this is probably for me the most important statement this evening because it will link perfectly to the question of entertainment, to the question of power, and to the question of architecture, which are all debates that are going to come up in the next panels. And what I want to understand from you is how radical could you imagine the reprioritization of museum space? Is effectively, are you actually saying in a weird kind of indirect way that the exhibition is a redundant form of knowledge transfer within a kind of sentient, aesthetic, and non-consumerist consumerist experience. And then I have to ask you, because you're an art historian, well, what about the source? What about the depots? What about the collections? What about the ideology of conservation? Kavita Singh said quite rightly that conservation is promoted by a rich boys club. And we need to regard the question of conservation as an ideological construct. It doesn't exist in the same way in different parts of the world. It's only in certain, certainly in, in European museums, you believe that an object has to be available for 1000 years and therefore better to keep it in a safe place than to let a transdisciplinary group of researchers investigate it. So is structural change really just a question of labels and taxonomic adjustment or can the museum become a civic space once again? And if it has to become a civic space, or which we would desire it to become a civic space, like a university or an art school, then what is the threshold? Is it social injustice? Is it the voice of the underrepresented? Or is it the actual ergonomy of studying, the ergonomy of engaging with artworks? This is my question to you. How can the museum become a civic space once again? No, thank you, Clementine. There's a lot in there to, to unpack. Um, and I, I'll struggle to answer and address everything that you said. I think we already assume that museums, uh, certainly in the US, it's the common assumption that museums are civic spaces. We call them public museums. They're located in the heart of cities and uh, we expect them to be open and available and meaningful to, to everybody. Uh, and it's a question of how we live up to that promise, that sense of mission that has always been there in our uh, museums. And that's really, the, I think, the struggle uh, to constantly adjust what museums do, what they are, who they represent in light of evolving uh, demographics, in effect, you know, our, our country is changing, it's changing uh, very quickly. And uh, the complaint is that museums aren't keeping up with uh, that pace of change. And it's a difficult thing to do because uh, collections are built over a long period of time. Artworks are very expensive. Uh, in the United States, we rely on gifts for the most part. So it involves a sort of a patron class whose interests and whose uh, face isn't necessarily represented by the people who come to the museum. So it's a, it's a, it's a deeply entangled, difficult situation to think about structural change. Philip mentioned boards of governors, for example, and they're very important in this country. They really rule things from the top down. Well, who are these boards of governors? You know, how do they get there? What power do they, they, do they exact on systems? It's, uh, uh, these are all questions that aren't really self-evident, I think, to uh, the public and, and need to be, because they, therein lies the, the, the possibility, I think, for uh, making meaningful change. But I don't, we're not gonna get away from the, I think, the, uh, um, the baseline of art museums revolving around precious objects. That's the way they've been defined. I mean, we could scrap the whole thing and make art museums like history museums, in effect, which is kind of what's been going on in the last 40 years and making objects tell stories. But we are locked into a, 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 a sense of what those objects are by these sort of inherited taxonomies and hierarchies. I don't know if I answered any of your questions, but. 
I would like to include two questions that came in through uh, the chat and through our online tool. Um, Sheridan is asking whether you can speak a little more about the difference between negative representation of the absence of indigenous and the need to authentically incorporate indigenous art into the mainstream of a gallery. Well, I think this issue of diversifying collections and creating a more inclusive um, uh, collection and space you know, is being addressed in the contemporary world uh, quite quickly. And it's, you know, it's easier to do to represent different voices and, and uh, different art forms, it seems, uh, in the contemporary world. My concern really is what happens in museums that are also historical in nature and how you go back into time and, in effect, create a more uh, inclusive, diverse history. And there you run up against the absence of objects simply that can speak to a variety of experiences. We are talking about museums that have for a very long time, if not forever, uh, concerned themselves with uh, elite uh, art forms. And so uh, as long as that is true, museums struggle to represent more than elite perspectives and uh, elite patrons and elite artists uh, for that matter. And so this issue of relabeling elite objects to be inclusive in a sense, in the case of these uh, colonial portraits that talk about the sitter's relationship to transatlantic slavery, uh, you know, it, it's, it complicates the canon. It's, it's an interesting thing to do, but it, it's, it, it doesn't get at representation in a more broader sense, except in a negative way because there simply is an absence of, of uh, uh, you know, we, we, we hear about a slave owners, enslaved uh, people, but we don't know anything about those people. There's no physical visual remnant uh, left to do that work. Maybe it's then also worth to include Natasha's question, who is asking about the people actually working as a, at the museum. So as she understands, we need diversity on all levels to change f the future of museums. That means also on the level of staff director, uh, directors, etc. So how open are museums to change from the inside and what is a good way to do it? And maybe you can keep your answer a little briefer because we have one more question I would like to include as well. It, it, that too is a struggle. I think it's ongoing. and I think it, it has a lot to do with institutions recognizing their own limitations and their own implicit biases against broader uh, hiring practices. Uh, I think that's work that can change and I think it is uh, in the course of changing. Uh, but it also is a question of what we call here the pipeline. You know, who are the students who are studying art history at universities? What limitations uh, do they face uh, going into the field in the first place? Art history in this country, at least, has long been an elite discipline. And that creates structural barriers to a broadening from the very base moving up into the uh, larger system. And our last question was also raised in the chat. Andrew, can you please clarify and respond on labeling matters in taxonomic museums? And is it enough to only label it for a museum? Uh, well, it, it, again, it's, if you're stuck with a collection, you have to, to deal with it. And it's a question of, you can, I think one can create all kinds of alternative interpretative structures that make objects tell different stories. And, uh, in historical collections, that's really what, what, what there is to be done. I mean, a lot of museums now are trying very hard to expand categories so that they can tell a wider variety of stories. But to the extent that we are dealing with what we already have, what has been inherited, what has been given over centuries, then it's a question of, of uh, trying to squeeze out of those objects as many different stories and perspectives as, as one can. And, labeling, docent tours, uh, interpretation, in short, is the, is the way to do that. I mean, so, if I can jump in here very briefly, it seems to me that one of the ways of breaking the, the barriers of taxonomy is to not look at a collection in isolation or a discipline in isolation any longer. So uh, what needs to be done is a much more heteroclite, uh, much more unexpected constellation of material that is selected by people who don't come from the inside of the museum, who are not the experts of the contextual taxonomy, 
but who are coming from the outside and want to see what happens when a particular object from a Cherokee background is placed next to, say, um, an, an object that would be in a period room, for example. This, that this kind of um, requirement to create um, a visual thinking has to feed into the way we, we process and de-taxonify or taxonomify uh, what we have now. And my feeling is that it can only be done through an extreme form of dialogical investigation. In other words, no collection can really be seen in isolation because the collection itself comes from a prior interest, a different oh. interest. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I would like to thank you too very much. It was really interesting to listen to your thoughts and ideas. And thank you so much for taking the time to answer the question as well. Thank you very much, Clementine, to take all the time for the whole day and uh, take, making all those statements. So a huge digital applause to the two of you. The Mars program actually continues and actually even starts the conversation with new perspectives on museums with the Future Forward panel, a great outlook, I think, to museums and futures by the upcoming museum of makers and shapers, in this case, Alain Bieber, whose sprint you already heard, and Eva Karl, a young curator uh, for, that we invited for this conversation. So I hope you had fun with the program so far. Thank you for participating in this deep dive and have fun with our Future Forward panel. Thank you very much.
Good evening from Germany to the global crowd. Hello, dear audience and visitors of the second Martin Roth Symposium in 2020. My name is Sarah Berg, talking to you from Munich, Germany, with many thanks. To the organizers, I have the pleasure welcoming you all at the end of each day of this so very interesting and wonderfully composed conference. The Future Forward Sessions closes each day of the symposium with a conversation between a forward-thinking professional and a student responder, maybe a critical eye and ear. In short conversations, we wish to wrap up some of the inputs and topics of the day that the two guests have been following and that they will kind of summarize uh, from their own viewpoints and with the focus of the day that is futures today, uh, power tomorrow, followed by entertainment and architecture. With our thoughts, we hopefully will be able to grab essentials, maybe touch hidden agendas and serve as handovers for the next day. So thank you for joining us. And my greetings go over to Düsseldorf and Berlin. Hello to Eva Karl and Alain Bieber. Um, with a just Hi. short introduction, with a short introduction, Eva Kai, she is a creative strategist and graphic designer working at the intersection of design, arts and culture. As creative director of an art gallery and blogger, she visited artists, uh, art fairs and museums and practiced through for interviews about the gallery of the future. And in 2019, she decided to widen her knowledge through studies of art and visual history, as well as cultural history and theory at Humboldt University at Berlin. The insights at the uh, interdisciplinary course curating emerging futures combined with her personal zeal inspired her to start the revelator and you might be talking about this later a toolbox for more relevance in cultural institutions worldwide revelator.org and you've already met alain bieber of course um cultural manager and curator and executive director of the cultural institution NRW Forum in Düsseldorf. Alan Bieber has been curating solar and group exhibitions all over Europe and topics such as street, street art, net and media art, political art and photography. So thank you for your participation to the two of you. So at the end of uh, this first day, and as we heard, visioning museum futures can't ignore digitalization, integration and decolonization processes that take globally at the moment. Um, but we have to put to consideration that, of course, context matter when we follow the main challenge of cooperation and the broadening of cooperation. At the beginning of the lockdown, a theater director put it that way in one of the first online events that could not take um, place in present. Maybe we should keep the theaters closed, he said, and send the actors back onto the streets to experience where performance came from originally. For instance, the marketplaces. So, well, theater performance is life art, your discipline, presenting art within buildings, you could say, uh, has been challenged as well. So, Alain, maybe at the beginning, um, how easy or better how hard is it to digitalize curatorial work i think um it could be quite easy um because most of the things are not it's not a rocket science or something the problem is sometimes that a lot of museums and i i think you heard this already in the other talks are very heavy structures very bureaucratic like mostly only the director is changing every five years, but the rest of the stuff is there for 10 or 20 years. And then change and change management in general is always very complicated. So it's a lot of work. People from the inside the structure, they always need to be willing to work on the change. And people from outside need to push, encourage, and develop the possibilities. I think this is for all kinds of fields the same, like for digitalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, if I, you like I already mentioned, you you did your research, and uh, in combination to this, would you agree? Is it 
not that hard? Is it easy to put it up in the digital world, on the internet, on social platforms, um, to present exhibitions? Uh, Clementine just put it that way, the exhibition might be dead. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. Um, uh, what kind of visitors are we facing in the digital world? So I, um, I call them the art user, um, which is kind of, I don't, maybe it's just me, for example, or it's people in my generation who are, who would call themselves digital natives, who are living out digitalization in their everyday lives, um, in the internet of things, in work 4.0. Um, so it's, it's just a question of media. And I wouldn't say it's really hard to to realize it but i get that there's so much structure that has been built um, throughout centuries before and you cannot like, suddenly leave that so um, there needs to be a, a good kind of transition towards the future and towards a new audience who expects more than just paintings on a wall to put it more um yeah to put it really sarcastic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Alain, you've been experiencing this uh, next museum that you, you, maybe you just share a little uh, what it, were the experiences or are the experiences with uh, um, opening out for, for art to be sent in objects for putting up exhibitions online. Maybe you just uh, tell us a little bit about how, how, it, how is it working on next museum. Yeah, sure. I, I, I must admit that I like to take the viewpoint of the visitor and I think that like objects are like more relevant to the audience when they are closer to the actual life. Like, of course, an advocate sees the exhibition completely different than a mother of three children. So I think participation is for me key and like getting the visitor involved, not only in art education and educational programs, but really in the program itself. And that's why we try out with Next Museum IO. It's a platform for for crowd creation and uh, co-creation means that we post open calls of different institutions, not only from us, there's also Museum Ulm and we're looking for other institutions that want to crowd, uh, create together with the crowd an exhibition. And we were really surprised by the overwhelming um, response. We had like almost 400 people that send it us proposition, artworks and so on. So um, I, I think, um, it's very interesting how to see that that a lot of people want to get more involved also in the program, I would say. Mm -hmm. And if it, you think that like this, you also have the chance of getting closer to different communities, like uh, Alan is just putting it, I mean, the art user, like you call them, um, they come from all different backgrounds. They are radical diverse, you could say. Um, so is that the chance in the future to get really closer to these art users, to art markets? Yeah. I would say it's one of the main points, actually, to, um, to include more viewpoints and more perspectives and also more approaches to problems uh, through, I don't know, maybe engineers, if it's a specific um, exhibition and also through the use of um, or the knowledge of designers who would bring more um, into the media insights, like what kind of media which should we use, what kind of platforms should we use. And um, what I really like about Next Museum is that it's uh, so uh, low threshold. Um, it's, it's really easy to, to participate. And I think that's also one of the main things. So participation and also um, a radical um, diversity that's also within the museums, maybe um, in, in the museum boards where you have those different kinds of um, expertise um, yeah, gathered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's why I also yes. didn't like my sign saying like expert, because in this thinking, everybody is an expert. Yes. Um, yes exactly. Maybe it, it has to do with life experience and then how you view things and how you approach things. And, and, and also, um, if you talk about decolonization of, of museums and um, how do you how do you look at a collection of a museum do you do you ask the hard questions like why is that artwork in the museum and um how could we change that i recently read that one museum changes uh, or sells one of their jackson pollock paintings in order to include more female and um female artists and per people of color 
into their collection. So that's one radical step into the future, I would say. Um, so um, one, of course, could ask um, how important will it then be that there are the experts, you know, in the uh, directing teams? Uh, how would you understand it? Like you already uh, referred to it, being an expert, uh, because then you just, with this radical concept, you could say uh, programming. Uh, what about programming? What about planning? Will you hand this over to the audience, to outer space? Yeah, we will, we will absolutely try uh, to, um, to make this happen. And I think like also perhaps it's in the museum world, uh, nobody like says it like clearly like this, but I think you can learn a lot of um, from startup culture, for example, from flat hierarchy, mm -hmm. from their agile work and so on. So. Um, there's a lot of techniques how you can um, um, involve more people and creativity and uh, and I think museums can learn a lot of the structures that's what we are trying like internally and also like um, trying really with the visitors to create a program exhibitions events and so on and also there is a lot of other museums also in Germany like uh, our partner museum Ulm is also um, changing their collection via citizen um, the wire citizen council so there's different citizens inside and they can also um, change and co-create the, the whole collection of the museum so there's a lot of new ways and ideas sounds good <laughs> yeah <laughs> so where are the spaces of um, i mean participation like the the theater director puts it has been putting it in in, in the beginning i mean then where should or could we meet like on a central base, where do we meet them? Not everything can happen in, 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 on the digital sphere. I hope that uh, people still meet in a museum. I really think that museums are important third places, but I think the answer is like good hybrid formats that on one way you have like, you are locally um, situated, uh, you get a, audience from the from the from your city but then you create exhibitions or events um, that are also on the internet for example if mm -hmm. you've been researching a lot about this so what is your resume what your conf your conclusion to how of the the museum of the future could really been installed and is it then relevant that they still get their money from the public? I mean, we're talking from <laughs> Germany, from German perspective now. So the, uh, the main point of the Relevator, or, um, the twist in it is that I don't provide the answers because um, my main point is to ask the hard questions um, for museum directors or galleries um, to ask the hard questions like where does my money come from, where are my dependencies, for example, and does that influence my way of programming, does it influence my way of um, doing museum work, for example. Um, I would agree on Allah on saying that hybrid formats are really, uh, yeah, uh, the right way to, to go into the future, to, um, to use those media that are already parts of us uh, that we always carry with us um, and also provide an, an, an analog space for um, for real life experience for meeting people because um, it's not only about the artwork and about the art but it's also about the people that are in that institution that come so um, maybe it's good to start with the question like who are we are we relevant to when we do this exhibition, um, who, which community do we want to, to um, talk to and to invite, like really invite um, literally into the room? And how can we do that? Like, do we really know those people and how, what is, what is important to them? Um, it's really getting down to that, to that simple area of um, yeah, starting from zero in that, in that case. Now, will you be answering to this? Yeah. yeah, I was more like referring and thinking about your beginning example of the theater director that sent the people on the street. So I, 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 I doubt that it's perhaps the best idea because they're also like, uh, of course, they are like um, street theater and street art and all this. 
but uh, how will he make his money from when he is like on the street so he also needs the structure and he needs like the audience and uh, I, I think um, the, the whole um, yeah it, it's also very important to think about new economical models how this can work and uh, has a future is because at the moment is a very a very dangerous situation for like uh, artists all over the world um, that uh, have um, no engagements no exhibitions and so on and um, how do they earn their life with this is like very important right now and so um, structures museums funding programs are very important stakeholders and players in this game so maybe a word um, also about, because um, uh, the speakers have been uh, talking about, of course, the idea, or the, the, the old idea of uh, the collections. Um, what, is, what kind of collections uh, do we, or will we be uh, collecting, putting up together in your concept, Eva, of, um, uh, of collecting digitally? Um. <laughs> I think it's a very individual question for uh, because um, maybe the concept of the artwork is also being uh, in question uh, in general. Maybe it's I think it's getting more into media art and um, having the artwork so in your phone, maybe approachable and always with you. Um, so it's it's not a question of only digital artworks uh, or only digital collections but um it, it's also it's also paintings and and you have those um you can you can digitize your collection and i think that's really important and also to make it public i think that that is one of them uh, and a really important point to make it more visible because I, in one of the the sprints um uh she I think the first sprint today, she was referring to all those artworks um, in collections that are not ma being made public and just sitting and waiting uh, to be made public somehow or somewhere. And which also requires more collaboration within or between museums. And um, I really like that idea to, to make more collaborations between museums. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I think like, um... I'm not a big fan of collections that are like static and stay there for years. And um, you have the classical program, the visitor comes, the artwork does not speak to him. He does not really understand what it's about and he doesn't care and is not interested and that's it. So I think um, in this visionary digital way, it would be very interesting to have changing collections that are perhaps adapted to me because algorithms know me as a visitor and what is like my interest or what uh, is my fear or what is like what what I what I love or what I hate so perhaps the collection could be like evolving changing and um, there's a buzzword I like it's like life curating like that uh, things like change in real time inside the exhibition and I think we have technology and possibilities to make things like this happen or for example another interesting point is that of course all objects um, refer in a different way to each visitor so but the text that are accompanying is always like static and always the same so it would be very interesting if um, I have another explanation, like my digital guide gives me another explanation about the artwork. And uh, so it would be more, more customized to my personal needs. This would be very interesting. But that also um, raises the question of uh, who is the cu curator of the future? Is it data? Is it an algorithm? Or um, is it still humans that work with those together? Absolutely, that's a very nice question, and that's a question we would like to experiment with. Um, we would love to have a kind of a artificial intelligence curator um, based on different uh, machine learning processes, and um, just to experiment if the machine is a better curator than a human, for example. <laughs> and so I think I think it could be. It could be here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're swimming far out uh, to the seas. Um, you know the, the old argument about 
quality. What about quality? Is it guaranteed that we still will be holding our idea or concept of quality? What would you say? How do we guarantee quality in the in in future museums when we also put in consideration that of course museums uh, still will be uh, institutions for learning and for education? So there's a, a true responsibility, of course. I would throw uh, in. I'm, I'm, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I would throw in a, a word or a term that's called return on experience, which is. Uh, quite common already in the business world and I think that is uh, increasingly more important because um, you you or as an art user you would expect more in a museum you would expect exchange and encounters and experience and um, maybe quality quality is redefined in, in that sense yeah, and I have a big problem with the term quality itself like I'm not sure what what it means and um, who defines the quality and what is a good quality and what is a bad quality. Um, I'm a huge fan of like amateur culture of trash in the internet and so on. A lot of people would say this is not quality at all. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's the personal view that decides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like who are the, what is changing is the gatekeepers of uh, who decides exactly. what is the quality. Yes. But maybe that's a good sign because it shows how democratized the museum maybe already is in some sense. Yes, and this is what the team will be meant because uh, the museum or Andrew, uh, the museum is a civic space. You know, of course, we all come in, we all have the chance. Uh, we, we try not to hold up barriers and then it's a common way of cooperation um, wherever that space might be. Um, so thank you, thank you. So maybe at the end of our short and futuristic <laughs> talk, um, what maybe in possible three to five words or thoughts or maybe glimpses from your side, uh, what would be like uh, the brave but mindful uh, jumps to realize a future orientated uh, museum what would you say what is definitely necessary and what is not that important anymore should I start or you wanna you, you can go um, <clears throat> I think what is really important is like more autonomy like radical autonomy would be nice because one thing that is a bit frightening and, uh, and dangerous is that a lot of um, museums are a bit scared, I have the impression, to not that, that you need to abide to the political correctness. And I think you need to be quite autonomous to have radical positions also in the art world, in the program and so on. And um, so more autonomy than uh, like sharing is caring, uh, I like a lot, and I would say perhaps like daring mm -hmm. with uh, Greta Thunberg, more daring, more sharing, more autonomy. <laughs> um, I would say transparency and um, interdisciplinarity um, is really important. I would, I would call it the parameters of change, um, or that's how I called it in, in the Relevator, um, which also mentions meaning and visibility for example and is the is the museum approachable and um one of the most important parameters of change is um the simple question who are you relevant to in, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think these are wonderful handovers for tomorrow's discussions about museums and power. And uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, Alain, you mentioned it uh, uh, in your input. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. More humor, more fun uh, in our museum spaces as well. Thank you. We will be coming back uh, to this and, of course, the, uh, the, 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 buildings, the buildings are important, the architecture. So the conference will just combine all this. Thank you, Eva and Alain. Thank you so much for sharing and for your thoughts at the end of this uh, first day. 
and of course thank you out there and um, maybe you'd like also to share your three essential thoughts on being brave and bright uh, uh, and collect wonderful new ideas for museum features museum futures as well so see you tomorrow and thank you bye bye Good. thank you very much bye, bye. Today we've discussed museums and futures, and tomorrow we'll continue with museums and power. And just like with jaguars and birds and nature, there's always uncertainty within power dynamics. This applies also to the museum world. Thanks to the organizing partners, Institut für Auslandsbeziehungen, Republika, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, and Germany's Federal Foreign Office. I see you all tomorrow for our second day here at the Martin Roth Symposium 2020.